The East Kirkby Air Show is one of the smaller events on the British air show circuit, but certainly one of the more charming ones. A single day show at a small, intimate venue in front of a crowd of just 5,000. It's one of the friendliest and most laid back air shows in the country, and that is represented in the flying program. There was a pleasant mix of vintage aircraft, one of the highlights being a terrific display by the Miles Gemini. The site is best known for being the home of the taxiable Avro Lancaster Just Jane, which performed several taxi runs throughout the day. It was joined by Europe's only airworthy Lancaster from the Battle of Britain Memorial flight, which took part in the flying display. This is our pick of the action. Hello and welcome to the Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage Centre for the East Kirkby Air Show 2022. And if you're thinking, hold on a second, I was at East Kirkby uh, and I don't remember it looking like that, well that's because I'm actually some way to the left of the public showground as you look out to the airfield, uh, capturing some clean audio of the displays without the commentary or the sounds of the crowd. But actually, I'm probably only 100 metres or so from the datum point, and that is one of the great things about these small, intimate venues. There's really no such thing as a bad vantage point. We're going to start with the Battle of Britain Memorial flight, which seems appropriate enough given the connection to the Lancaster that this place has. And if you don't know about that, then uh, it's something that uh, we'll be talking about over the episode to come and I hope you enjoy it. So here we go, the East Kirkby Air Show 2022, headlined by the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, an organisation that has links to this place for several reasons. Firstly, they are based at Coningsby, which is just seven miles away as the crow flies. Secondly, East Kirkby was a Lancaster base during the Second World War, and finally, there is a Lancaster here. The BBMF's example is the only airworthy Lancaster in Europe, and the one based here at East Kirkby is the only fully taxiable example in Europe, aside from the BBMF's. And we'll see the Lancaster solo display in a moment, but first up, it's the turn of the fighters. Here is the Spitfire Mark II, painted up as a Battle of Britain era Mark I from 54 Squadron, known as Kiwi III, as it was flown by New Zealander Aldir. And the Hurricane Mark II C, representing BE 634 of 247 Squadron, painted matte black and featuring small, low visibility roundels to enhance the aircraft's survivability during night intruder missions.
now it's the turn of the Lancaster. Always particularly welcome here. As you'd expect with a Lancaster based here and undergoing restoration to flight, there's a certain amount of cooperation between the Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage Centre and the BBMF. Parts and expertise are sometimes shared. And in 2014, when the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum's Lancaster visited these shores, uh, the Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage Centre lent one of their engines to the Canadian operation when they encountered problems with one of their own. Next up, another great favourite of the UK airshow scene. They are the only civilian airshow performer permitted by the UK Civil Aviation Authority to arrive from crowd rear. It's the Blades. You'll notice the lead aircraft is in the colours of the Air Race World Championship, a project in which the Blades have been involved. It was fitted out in these colours in late 2021 for an air race training camp, but this was its final outing in air race colours. They were finally removed a few days after the show. This is one of the most impressive manoeuvres, a combination of stall turns and pushovers called Falling Angels. And now the team dive back towards show centre for the first split of the display, the crossfire break, so called because two of the aircraft will split across each other. It's very good to see the Blades back up to a four-ship. They've been down to just two aircraft for the past few weeks during some unscheduled fleet-wide maintenance work. We saw the two-ship display at Southport a few episodes ago and they did a rather good job, it must be said, but there is no substitute for the proper quartet. The Blades don't just perform formation aerobatics, there's also some excellent solo aerobatic flying in their display. We haven't featured very much of that, however, because there is an extra 300 solo coming up later in the programme, and that features a slightly more manoeuvrable single-seat extra 300S, as opposed to these two-seat extra 300Ls. Another classic Blades manoeuvre now, this is Crazy, the solo pilot chasing them down just out of shot.
This weekend saw the return to the blades of Ian Smith, a former Royal Air Force Jaguar pilot and an ex-Red Arrow who last flew for the blades in 2014. He is guest flying in the Blade 2 slot for several shows in the second half of this season. Now pulling up in line abreast for synchronised stall turns. And quickly transitioning into line astern formation for the blade's snake. Now, box formation, a four-ship quarter clover from the right, with the aircraft splitting apart on the downline. The leader and slot pilot sticking together though, and they will pull up for the heart. Now in for one final bomb burst to conclude a very polished performance indeed. We've got a pair of aircraft next that have become quite familiar to us this season. We've seen this one at the Midlands Air Festival and at the Cosford Air Show, so this is our third time featuring it this series. It will be the last time we see it this year though, because this is our final British Air Show of this series of Air Show Dispatches. The aircraft is, of course, P-51D Mustang Warhorse, owned by Warbed Experiences, but operated on the airshow circuit by the Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight, an organisation that we perhaps didn't hear much from in previous years, but which has become extremely active over the past 12 months or so. I'm not going to reiterate the history of this aircraft or its paint scheme for a third time of asking, but instead I will leave you to enjoy the sounds of the P-51D Mustang.
The same goes for our next participant. The PR-19 Spitfire, owned by the Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight and based down at East Midlands Airport. We've talked about it extensively in the past. The short version is that this was a meteorological research aircraft and later a founding member of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. But enjoy, on this occasion, the sound of the Griffin uninterrupted for a few short minutes. Last pass coming up, and as you would expect from a Spitfire display, it's a victory roll. On now to probably my favourite display of the day, it's Stu Blanchard in his wonderful Miles Gemini. This is a display of the finest quality. The aircraft is constantly either pitching or rolling. The footprint of the performance is extremely compact and the crowd get to see this gorgeous aircraft from every angle at very close quarters, not least during some wonderful photographer-pleasing topside passes. Stu is not afraid to exercise the aircraft's rather sprightly roll rate, as you can see. This is an aircraft he owns, he brought it to the airshow circuit in 2019, and we are very glad he did. The Gemini was produced between 1945 and 1947, just 170 of them were made, and it was one of the very last products of the Miles Aircraft Company.
Most of Miles' aircraft were aimed at the military, the likes of the Magister Trainer and the Messenger Liaison aeroplane, for example. But post-war, Miles was keen to develop products for the civilian market. So they created this, a twin-engined civilian version of the Miles Messenger. It's a four-seat touring aircraft with a cruising speed of 110 knots and a 500-mile range. And initially, it was quite popular. Further improvements were planned, which would have doubtless led to further sales. That included modifications to the wing and the adoption of new engines. But sadly, the company went bust in 1947 before these could be implemented. We'll get back to the flying displays shortly, but on four occasions throughout the day, we saw taxi runs by the resident Lancaster B7, Just Jane, which is undergoing restoration to flight here. This is the museum's main attraction and its main reason for being. Very much a multi-generational family project for museum owner Andrew Panton as he seeks to restore this aircraft in memory of Christopher Panton who was killed flying Lancasters in the Second World War. It's not the only aircraft based here though, and also calling the museum home is Tony Aga's Taxiable Mosquito, the only taxiable mosquito in Europe, and that aircraft also performed several taxi runs through the day. But back to the flying, and we hand over to Steve Carver in the Extra 300S. He's a captain, instructor, and type rating examiner on the Embraer 145. He also flies gliders and competition aerobatics. In 2014, he joined the Global Stars, the acclaimed Little Gransden-based aerobatic team, which we've seen several times in airshow dispatches, performing as far afield as China, India and Bahrain. This is one of the Global Star's aircraft. You can tell not just from their distinctive colour scheme, but also from their trademark Wi-Fi controlled dotty smoke system, which not only makes for an interesting visual effect, but also reduces the smoke oil consumption over the course of the display.
Immediately after this performance, Chris landed, refuelled and then took off bound for France for a four-ship pyrotechnic evening display with his teammates at the Montfort Balloon Festival. A lovely 135 degree three-point hesitation roll into a negative G outside turn. And then a snap roll on the way up, effectively a controlled power on spin. The Extra 300S is probably the ultimate air show and competition aircraft from the 300 series, at least until the more powerful Extra 330s came along and started dominating competition aerobatics worldwide. As you can see, East Kirkby is a roughly south-facing venue, so you do look almost directly into sun for most of the day. Generally, that is seen as not being very desirable, especially by photographers. But this is a display that greatly benefited from those challenging lighting conditions. At times, you can see the aircraft casting a shadow on its own smoke between us and it, which is a rather ethereal effect. Always a very difficult display to film, this is Bob Davies' Yak 3U, which is now in his second year of displaying. It's based here in the UK, but is on the French register. It's one of five Yak-3 UTIs built in Romania in the 1990s from the original plans but fitted with a Pratt & Whitney R2000 engine rather than the original Shvetsov. Nowadays, sourcing the parts needed to keep a Shvetsov engine running would be prohibitively difficult. The Yak-3 UTI was a radial engine two-seat trainer version of the Yak-3U fighter. It became the prototype for the very widely used Yak-11 trainer. The main difference is that the Yak-11 had a longer, larger cockpit, but otherwise the two types are almost identical. As it's a new build, you could say this Yak-3 is a replica. Well, here's another replica, a scale replica of the SE-5A built in 1983. The real SE-5 was often considered to be the best performing and most formidable British fighter of the First World War and was designed at the Royal Aircraft Factory in Farnborough. At the time the SE-5A entered service in 1917, the balance in the air was tilted very heavily in Germany's favour and the SE-5A was crucial in readdressing that. A little over 5,000 were built. It would have been more but for supply problems with its Hispano Suiza 8B engines. This meant the introduction to service of the SE-5A was quite slow and it took over a year for the full complement of squadrons to receive their aircraft. The delays were eventually rectified when a British licence-built derivative of the Suiza was introduced in 1918, the Woolsey Viper, which sped up production significantly.
After the war, the SE-5A was retired from British service almost immediately, but it flew with various foreign air arms thereafter, and it continued to serve as the primary fighter of the fledgling Royal Australian Air Force into the late 1920s. To conclude the programme, we have a pair of two-ship formation teams, and first up is the Vintage Pair. Making their debut in 2019, the vintage pair pays tribute to a former Royal Air Force display team of the same name, which flew a Vampire and a Meteor. It's a non-aerobatic act, not because the aircraft aren't capable, but because of the fatigue limits currently enforced on chipmunks in the UK. That's not necessarily a bad thing though, because the aircraft stay much lower and much tighter to the crowd than they likely would if this was an aerobatic sequence. There's a very nice rejoin coming up at the end of this opposition sequence. The Portuguese Air Force schemed example in the lead, but being chased down and very swiftly joined by the Royal Air Force liveried aircraft and joining up for one last pass in formation. Our final display of the day is the Aero Superbatics Wing Walkers running in now for their opening loop. They are the only formation wing walking aerobatic team in the world, and they've been around since 1986. Since then, they've performed under many guises the Crunches Flying Circus, the Utterly Butterly Barnstormers, Team Gino, and most recently, the Breitling Wing Walkers. One of these aircraft is still in the remnants of its distinctive orange Breitling scheme. The other is in Aero Superbatic's corporate flying circus livery. And now the team break into a lovely sequence of opposition passes, lovely by any standards, but particularly so when you remember that there are two lycra-clad wing walkers strapped to the top.
These are probably some of the finest, best executed and most photogenic opposition passes you'll see from any aerobatic team. And they've got a lot of stage presence thanks to the bright colours, the thick smoke and the really rather grating roar they make, partly produced by their Wasp Junior R985 engines and partly produced by the tips of the propeller blades which are just exceeding the sound barrier. The team has flown all over the world, as you might expect from a unit that is not only totally unique, but which has also had the backing of several big name sponsors over the years. They've displayed in China, Australia and the United Arab Emirates, among a total of more than 20 countries. As I mentioned before, this is our last episode from a UK air show this series, so it's fitting that we end with such a popular and well-known British air show act. For the rest of this series, we'll be taking you all over the world, next up to the brilliant Air Legends show in France, then to a truly historic air show at Edwards Air Force Base in the USA, and later in the year, returning to Australia. So, as the Wing Walkers wrap up their performance, that concludes our look back at the East Kirkby Air Show 2022. Do join us next time from Air Legend, a 90 minute film coming to you at the end of September, packed with rare warbirds and a particular focus on classic jets. I, for one, cannot wait. But until then, thank you very much for watching. From me, Adam Landau, it's goodbye for now.